Tired. So tired. Overtired. Hey, people. People listening to podcasts, this is uh, this is Brett Terpstra. You're listening to Overtired. I am here, as always, with my esteemed co-hosts, Christina Warren and Jeff Severns Gunsel. Uh, how you guys doing? Good. I'm good. I'm tired, but other than that, I'm good. You just you just woke up. I did just wake up, which is like bad of me, but I just it's been a, I've had an incredibly like busy like long week, and next week is going to be even worse. And I just it was completely. And I feel guilty saying this because we'll talk about it because you were the one who actually got sick. But I've just been like, I'm like, I'm so dead to the world. Yeah, yeah. you described your couple of weeks coming up at some point, maybe even on the episode last week. And it sounds like something you'll be happy to be through. Yes, 100%. <laughs> like a, a trial for sure. <laughs> I uh, I can tell I have recovered from COVID because I have been up since 1 a.m., um, not manic. I was sleeping really well there for a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I was sleeping till like 8 a.m., which is insane for me. Oh. Um, but yeah, this morning I woke up at 1 and just like tossed and turned until 6 a.m. and then just got up. But yeah, I'm tired. So I I went to Minneapolis, as previously discussed, uh, had some great dinners, saw some great people. Uh, got home uh, a couple days later, got very tired, and uh, my girlfriend was like, you should test. And so I tested, and sure enough, I had COVID. Um, I know I did not have COVID going to the cities because I had tested, and I pretty much isolate by default. Um, the only person I had seen for a week before I left was was Elle, and she she was not sick. Um, so I think if I had to guess, I got it from the tow truck driver that I spent 20 minutes in a, in an enclosed cab with on the way to the cities. Um, and And those tow truck drivers, I could just tell you from experience, they can talk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he, he, he had stories about his like (laughs) ex step son-in-law was suing him. He was on the he was on the phone with his lawyer when I got into the cab and then he then he had to explain the whole situation. So I checked with everyone that I visited. No one else has tested positive. So I don't think I spread it anywhere. Um, no one else has had any symptoms at all. So it's just me. I did get L sick. Um, so L and I have had COVID this week. Uh I am fully recovered at this point, and I think Elle may have another day left before she's back to 100. But yeah, after after two and a half years, I finally decided to see what this whole COVID thing was about. And uh, what, what's the consensus from your perspective? Like, I enjoyed the days off. I, I love sick days because I don't feel obligated to do anything. I get to just be and like just deal with the sickness i can just watch tv all day and it doesn't matter and that's kind of that's freeing so i don't hate sick days um and honestly like aside from being super drained with a lot of like phlegm it wasn't the worst thing in the world and it only lasted two days had you guys, I don't remember, like, had you had, like, the, the newest booster yet or no? I have. I, yeah. I have had, I have had two, two vaccines and one booster. I had, I had not gotten the second booster yet. Um, and now I have to wait three weeks before I can right. get it. But I do think that vaccination was why my symptoms only lasted two days and weren't severe. Oh yeah, no, without a doubt. No, I was just curious because the, the reason I was asking is I also I recently like like Jeff got the new booster and I've been like wanting to have like a listen like to people like has that actually helped like in terms of yeah. how quickly people either a recover or b like if you actually get it or not. Well, I'm glad you're better. Very glad you're better. So, I sent you guys some videos. Um, yes, love this. This is so good. The drummer in my in the band I was in in my early twenties, late teens, early twenties, onward to mayhem. <laughs> he he apparently, and I had no memory of this, but apparently there was video taken all through our East Coast tour, um, and 
and he sent me a couple gigabytes of it's you know it's the video you could shoot in 1999 it wasn't like high res or anything uh but the sound quality is surprisingly good for a, yeah. a handheld video camera in 1999 yeah um, yeah totally i won't say totally. i won't say the music was surprisingly good but the sound quality was okay <laughs> <laughs> um, and i i clipped a couple songs out uh one of them being a horribly drunken cover of paradise city by guns and roses um <laughs> punk rock style super fast super fun <laughs> and and me being a total asshole on stage but uh but that it was a rush of memories man that was crazy to see i bet it was how long was the tour um a month maybe that's a long time i have such blurry memories of the whole thing um i i was i was trying i was addicted to heroin and trying to score from city to city. Uh, I remember I was able to score in Baltimore, in New York, in Philadelphia. But I think other than those three, I was pretty much sick every time we took stage and was just like drinking to like get through it. Um, so I was, I was not, I was not, a, I, like I was, I thought I was being funny, but I was just mm-hmm. being an asshole. Um, and lesson and talking over, <laughs> talking over everyone else. Like mm-hmm. just, I, I would not have wanted to be in a band with me, but I also would not have wanted to be in a band with our lead singer. Um, I don't think I could have handled him, his personality without heroin and alcohol. Uh, our drummer who shared the video was straight edge at the time may still be, I don't know how he did it. I asked him. He said, I don't know how he did it either. Hitting things every night. Yeah, maybe. What I realized, though, is, right, just beating on things. Um, I wasn't as political as I remember being. I was just, I was a drunk punk just out for the the punk points, I guess. Right, which makes sense. Well, yeah, I was going to say, because one of the guys in your band had like an ACAB, like it looked like a tattoo, but mm-hmm. it probably wasn't a real tattoo. No, like, it was a real tattoo. Oh, it was a real tattoo. And I was, yeah. like, I was like, I was like, this is like 98 or 99. I was like, okay, that's that's pretty badass. But like, also, you know, that's 23 years ago. So not what I was, like that definitely wasn't a term that I knew back then, but I was also like 15 years old. So, you know, um, and lived in the suburbs so you know um like we were like fuck the cops but mostly because they would pull us over and like give us tickets <laughs> right because they were an, they were an inconvenience <laughs> exactly exactly yeah um, it was it was completely because it was an inconvenience it was like nothing to do with like actual like systemic like violence or anything else like that because like <laughs> we're like we used to have this thing called Cop Watch in Minneapolis. It may still be a thing, but I'm curious because Jeff has a better memory of Cop Watch than I do. Uh, how would you describe Cop Watch, Jeff? Cop Watch was a bunch of drunk punks <laughs> walking around looking for police who have pulled people over so that they can watch them. And it was a it, with with video cameras. With video cameras and the people I knew who were in Cop Watch, which on the face of it is a is a perfectly, you know, reasonable and 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 you know, admirable sort of cause. Uh especially in Minneapolis, because what we know about Minneapolis now is, has been true for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, but cop watch were like punks that got together. I mean, I kind of admired them a little bit, but then when I started to get to know the cop watch guys, I was like, Oh, you guys just get drunk and, and yell at the <laughs> cops with your video cameras on. Like a, <laughs> right. it's not really my, it's not my jam. It's not very punk. Actually. I remember feeling very noble. It seemed very yeah. noble at the time. But it did. It's yeah. no, I know I got really fucked by cop watch because um, we were playing a benefit show for cop watch in a house at a house party. And it was a, actually a going away party for one of the kind of, most sort of involved members he was moving to like california or something and um and the police by this point the minneapolis police had 
you know, they, they were just looking for an opportunity to fuck with the cop watch people if they had it. And, and this was a, and this was a known, this is a house my brother lived in, a bunch of people lived in it, but it was also known to have, you know, like cop watch leaders in it and cop watch meetings in it and whatever. So we were playing a show. We were the only band playing. We played the basement, um, which is a place we had played before because my brother lived in the house and, you know, sometimes the skinheads would come and steal the keg and, you know, it's kind of that kind of scene. Um, but we had a policy if we were playing house shows, if the police came to just close our eyes um, for like plausible deniability, <laughs> like we didn't oh know there God. were police here and we just keep going with it. And then they would eventually. I'm sure like, that worked cut. completely. Well, it, would t- it bought us a minute or so. And, uh, and it was thrilling to do, if I'm being honest, it was just kind of oh, like, of Oh my God, I'm just going to close my eyes and I have no idea what the fuck's going to happen. Um, but they would cut the power or cut the lights or whatever. And then we'd get out. But it, so that was a normal thing. But in this case, when the noise complaint came in, man, they were ready. Like they, so basically they came in and they were just like everybody out, everybody out. And when we got out to the front of the house, there were five or six squad cars and a police helicopter. Which in Minneapolis was known as the ghetto bird, which Code yes. 13 had a song about. Right. Uh, and they were just grabbing people and throwing them in squad cars, like very randomly, like, you know, like kind of young. I remember seeing a young girl get kind of grabbed and, you know, and um, and and I noticed that my cousin who had who had been drinking a lot was like in a sort of verbal altercation with the police and they like took him down and I I rushed over there. Um, yelling at them to let him go. And, um, and they stood up and pointed, just like pulled out the mace and pointed it at me. And they're like, get away, get back. And I wasn't a big drinker, didn't do drugs. I am just the kind of person who thought at that <laughs> moment to say, you can't mace me. I'm a rock and roll drummer. Oh my God. <laughs> and, at which point they three police you. like emptied their fucking mace. Turns me. out. Absolutely. And, Turns out. Don't and, care. Cuffed, and cuffed me and threw me in the back of a car. And then they, they squeezed two other people next to me so that they had to like kind of breathe in. I was just like, I was like emanating, you know, tear gas or whatever, pepper spray. And, um, and they took me and a bunch of other people downtown and, and as they handed me off, they, it was an underground jail at this point. It was in our old city hall. So I had no idea that was there. They drive us like underground. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck's going to happen. Like I had had a friend, uh, a singer in a band of mine when I was in high school told me that he was once taken by Minneapolis police down to a specific point on a riverbank and they threw leather jacket over him and started beating him. And so I knew they had like spots, but I'm like, there's no way the basement of the city hall is one of their spots. Catacombs. So out comes some other police. And when they hand me off, the guy goes, watch out. This one's a mean one. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not mean. <laughs> like, well, I just didn't like that you were beating on my cousin. Like, I'm I'm a rock and roll drummer. I'm not mean. Uh, I'm, I'm not mean. I'm, I'm, I'm just a dumb enough guy to like yell yeah. at the cops and be well, like, well, my brother can't, recently. Can't get me. <laughs> yeah, my brother was the singer in the band, and he recently reminded me a part I had forgotten, which is after they maced me, my response was to yell, I can take the mace. <laughs> <laughs> so they think you're high, too. They're like, like they're right. Like, and I'm totally not you're like, you're and, not. Right, that's I've had thing. that problem. I've had that problem my whole life where friends or whatever. I've had inter- I had an intervention in junior high where three of my friends sat me down in the cafeteria and they're like, hey, we're we know you're doing speed. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, no, this is just me. Like, I'm not, I'm just, I'm only in like second gear right now. But anyway, the like crazy thing about that, I re- I went back a couple years ago to get my mug shots from that time. This is a long time ago. This is like '96, probably. And uh, and as a reporter, I had been down to get documents from the police all the time. And I, and I went in. And I said, I'm looking for a, a mug shot. And they're like, okay, what was the name? I was like uh, Jeffrey Gunsel, birth date of birth, gave him my date of birth. They come back like, all right, we have it. Um, what's your name? <laughs> like Jeffrey Gunsel. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, was, I am just here getting my own mugshot from 20 years ago or whatever. Uh, the close of that, because Brett, I don't mean to like take your punk rock oh, story too far. No, this uh, is this is exactly what I wanted from this. <laughs> is um, so we spent a night in jail, which was really it was a experience for me that I um, draw upon constantly because it is the case that even a night in jail, I had a friend who did uh, five or six years in jail and, and had asked if I'd ever been arrested or in jail. I said, well, I did an overnight 
and and she was like that counts and the the experience was it was so packed that night that i was wedged next to a toilet um which was just an open space yeah and and people would come over and pee and it would splash on me and i couldn't move and the other thing i remembered which is very minneapolis very america but very minneapolis is that one half of this room was black the other half was white like everyone was perfectly segregated and i don't i don't remember noticing anybody else anybody hispanic anybody you know like whatever but like one half was black one half was was white and um and then i'll never forget they they brought in after hours and hours of being in there they brought us um like shrink wrapped apples and and i'm sitting next to a toilet with my shrink wrapped apple i'm super fucking hungry but i'm not anyway the entire experience was like really powerful it's just powerful to know you're in a place you can't leave like it's really yeah. i've visited prisons many times and i remember mm-hmm. once i used to visit people on death row um as part of a volunteer thing i did and i remember counting all of the locked doors as they locked behind me as i went towards oh. the you know death row area and and what an intense feeling it was to know that like i am in a place in that case i could ask to leave which everyone else can't right. but like I can't just leave. Like there's so much between me and the outside. And in, and even in that overnight, it was, that was such an intensely strong feeling of, of the control and power they had over me. Right. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm glad I had that experience uh, because it, 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 even though it was like a micro micro version of what it's like to go to jail for longer or whatever, it's not, it's not nothing. Yeah. <laughs> no, anyway. Fact, you so to, you got to actually experience, but also like that, that's, I mean, it's I it's funny because it's like it is kind of punk to to get to. I mean, it's for a hilarious reason. Like you had a party, so it's like the least punk right. reason to to get like arrested. Arrested, right? Yeah. But. My my only overnights were after protests, so they were also packed. But I can tell you, um, as far as that like idea of not being able to leave, uh, if you think junk sick sounds bad imagine getting junk sick in the middle of the night in a room you can't leave that is oh, yeah. an awful feeling i bet i bet it yeah. makes you hate everybody i'm sure <laughs> <sighs> well okay so that story closes with us going to court uh three of us the three that were in the car the two that were in the car with me and they the police had behaved so incredibly um wrong and, and and against law and order um, that it was clear our case is going to be dropped. But our attorney, which was an illegal aid attorney, had to go in and make that argument to the judge. It's like, you know, look, this what the police did that night was really messed up. You can either have that be a thing we talk about for a long time or you can <laughs> let these guys go. And before the lawyer went into the he's like, OK, who's who's Sean? Okay, right. Who's Michael? Right? Okay, who's Jeff? Right. And and who is it that said you can't mace me. I'm a rock and roll drummer. <laughs> I was like, that, that was me, sir. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh my God. Anyway, cop watch. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Brett. Brett. So no. I want to describe Brett's video quickly, which is that what was amazing about Brett's video is Brett had hair. First of all, I wanted awesome. to bring this up. I was like, Brett has, <laughs> yes. had like really describe, good hair. Describe actually. him. Fit check. Describe him. Yeah, no, so, so the, 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 like, the great, like, head of, like, blonde hair, you know, is just, like, a, a, like a, a good hairline, too, which I was looking at, I was like, I'm surprised you went as bald as you went, because, like, your hairline was good then, like, did it just, and I am curious, like, did it just, like, it was it a, a pretty quick thing that your, your hairline I, just kind of, like, so woke I, up? I had a widow's peak as a kid. Um, okay. Like, I always had, like, Eddie Munster widow's peak. Sure. Um, but yeah, like when I turned, I think about 25, I started getting the bald spot in the back and my hairline started receding. And within a year, I just shaved my head and I've had it shaved ever since uh, or buzzed anyway. Which is right, which never... is, yeah, no, which is, which is the move. Like if you yeah. can't get on the Propecia early, like you can get on Propecia. Um, me and uh, Justin Williams are both obsessed with hairlines, and we talk to each other about this a lot because we're Justin like Justin Williams, have... a software developer. Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, Justin Williams, a software developer, who's also the male version of me. If anyone is unaware of this, if anyone knows who he is, <laughs> he and I are like genuinely like the male female version of one another. We're like twins. <laughs> it's very bizarre. Um, our personalities are remarkably similar, but yeah. 
if, if this is happening, like you can get on Propecia if you have the um, you know, the Elan or the the Jeremy What's His Face money to get like the the good like transplant surgery, you can do that. You know, uh, Propecia, but the thing with Propecia, like you have to start it early. Like you yeah. can't start it late, right? Like I gotta say, waking up in the morning and not having to worry about your hair. Yeah, oh, yeah. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't miss worrying about my hair. No, well, the thing is, like I was gonna say though, but this is what I appreciate about you. Like, if you're not gonna do the preventative stuff, and if you're not gonna do like the, you know, um, the the Alon and the and the Jeremy, fuck, what is his last name? The guy from Entourage. Last name starts with a P. I would not know the answer. Oh, to that question. Jeremy spoke in class today. Jeremy Piven. Jer- Jeremy <laughs> Piven. Jeremy Piven, who was fucking bald. No, he like had bad. Like he like was fucking bald. He has like one of the best hair transplants. Jude Law is another one. Great, great like uh, natural hair transplant work. If you're not going to do that, and if you're not going to get on the Propecia, then you gotta just you gotta embrace. It, you just gotta shave it, right? Like. Yeah. <laughs> which I really appreciate that you did like the right thing because there's nothing that is sadder than like somebody who you know is bald and then they're just like hanging on to every little thing. It's like, no, dude, you you, you got to shave the head. My dad, my dad went bald pretty young and for years, not, it's not a comb over when you, when, when you don't have enough hair to actually cover anything up, you just have the like wisp <laughs> that you mm-hmm. like comb into place and for years, for for decades, my dad just had a little bit of hair and he grew out what he could and he like combed it over. Uh, finally, at the age of like 70, he started buzzing his hair and it looks great. He looks good. I It looks <laughs> a lot less sad. Should have done he should have done it 30 years that, earlier. Yeah. Like, well, you know, those, you know, those middle school band teachers that like they're bald on top, but they have the ponytail. Yes. That's a horrible <laughs> look. I feel like the Simpsons epitomized that pretty well in cartoon form. Yeah, the, yes. the but, Simpsons yeah. and King of the Hill, the King of the Hill, I think yep. um, too. Yeah. But, but 100%. I feel like, I feel like it's a trope. I feel like everyone has had like one band teacher or one music teacher that had the ponytail in the bald spot. Uh, well, yeah. So, so, so the takeaway from those concert videos was the hair is that, is that safe to say? Uh, I have a takeaway. Um, you guys, uh, you know, doing Paradise City, um, yeah. which we've since learned was a faithful enough cover that you got a YouTube. Uh, <laughs> YouTube put a copyright, copyright notice on it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's funny. I don't know why I've been I've been in sort of a Guns N' Roses phase and thinking about those guys. Mm-hmm. Um, it happens just thinking about their sort of really weird history and how there's a whole phase where, you know, the guitarist Buckethead is the slash of guns and roses. And right. Like, it's also interesting, but anyway, um, that song, it's components are so fucking solid that you guys could just, basically make it up because you were just like yeah let's try it well the drummer did the drummer claims he didn't remember that was right. his way of hoping not to have to play it he remembered the <laughs> no <laughs> he remembered everything <laughs> he just he told your your singers like should we do the cover what do you think I everybody think he's like i forgot it it's like nobody forgot me, paradise me, city me and dago <laughs> loved doing that song maddie and and clay did they hated playing guns and well Roses. so here's the thing here's the thing when that song kicks into right like it is yeah. all each of the components of that song are so solid that they can be mishandled terribly right <laughs> um right it's like it's like a well is, written like song yeah and like it still rocks <laughs> well no cuz cuz that's that's the thing about them right i think that's why they were like the, the one kind of like band of that era that like actually did still sustain into like 91 like in the grunge thing like they still had hits because they had solid yeah. songs whereas like and again this is like you guys is way more than mine because i was a small child and this was also not my music but this was like for, from what i understand what what my going back and listening to like the reason that the other bands of that era didn't really transcend in addition to just the whole look thing not not matching with what people were wanting to do and and axel being able to be much more like fit into into that realm i think the songs were just better like they were more solid like songs where you could be like 
damn it, I hate this whole scene, but all right, yep. that's a good ass song. Fuck it, you know? Guns N' Roses had an anger to them that a band like Rat or Poison just never did. Um, right. And I feel like that that played to their uh, their popularity. No, I think you're right. I put these videos up on YouTube as unlisted videos. I am dropping links to them in the show notes. So if anyone is curious what Brett was doing at the age of 20, it was me. It's a fun, it's really fun to watch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was fun for me. Yeah. No, but, it was, really, it was uh, yeah. really great to see. And and like, it looked like you guys were having a great time. And I was, I was looking at it and I was like, oh man, you guys must have gotten so laid because <laughs> because like you had like a good look and and like i was like i you know because i i was i mean it was emo bands but like i would i you know not not that far dispersed from that era like i would go to a lot of shows and stuff and like stalk guys in bands and like i was like yeah you guys must have been so laid like so you would think and and there were definitely like i fended off advances like i had a steady girlfriend that I was pretty damn committed to and uh, Dago was the only one in the band who would cheat on his girlfriend who was with us on tour. Um, Whoa, that's, that's next level. Maddie, Maddie had very little interest in girls and I don't, I don't remember Clay's situation, but yeah, basically there there was not a lot of sex on that tour. Um, I remember being drunk in basements and pushing girls off of me. Um, I had a girl tell me, I had a girl tell me she had taken the picture from our seven inch and blown it up and put it over her bed, uh, which <laughs> that's, that's weird. Yeah, that's weird. That's weird. I, I would never have shared that, but I understand like the impulse to do that. I never would. Have oh, shared I understand that. that. I understand the impulse a thousand percent. I just pasted in the chat the band that I stalked when I was like 15, 16 years old. And try guys. Uh, no, I wit. No, we'll talk about that because wow, that's some good drama. No, this this is a band called Saves the Day. And awesome. uh and oh, that's a great photo. Yeah. So I'm just saying, like, if those guys were were getting like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you guys who totally like had a much more masculine, much more like, you know what I mean? Like a much more kind of a better like vibe. Like their, their debut album is called through being cool. <laughs> awesome. Which awesome. We thought they were, they were not, but we really thought they were. <laughs> um, my, uh, my, my friends, Melissa and Kat and I would follow them all over the Southeast. And then, uh, and they all had girlfriends, which of course, and then Melissa and we would make out with them because now they were not dumb enough to travel like with the girl, like tour with the girlfriends and then cheat on their girlfriends. But of course they're all going to like, you know, Mac with other girls. And like, I'm aware of this. I'm like, I know you have girlfriends. I know that I'm making out with you and that you do not care anything about me. I absolutely know the score. Kat and Melissa apparently never got the message and like got into fights on the message boards with the girlfriends. And then we were like, <laughs> it became awkward. And I was kind of like, I can never go to these shows again. And then like two years later, they're on fucking Conan O'Brien. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like they really actually blew up. And I was like, those bitches not being like chill completely ruined my ability to like, maybe actually <laughs> fuck a rock star. Like I will, I will never forgive them for that. None of my girlfriends have ever cared about my music. It has always been like an external thing. Oh, and then also he plays, I was just a bass player who cares about bass players. I don't know. Man. The bass player was who was the, was that the was that the guy that like didn't have a name in um that thing you do was was that the, yeah that was the bass player. This is a movie that only I have seen. I, I now realize my sister my sister loved that movie so much. My sister had poster from that movie. I cannot remember it at all. Yeah, that that was the one with Liv Tyler and uh uh what was it something in a, a three name guy. Um, it was a uh, Tom Hanks's, uh, I think he directed it or it was definitely his, his production company that made it, but it was about kind of like the, the band, uh, like kind of like a, a sixties band sort of thing. Um, yeah. and, uh, it was that, that was a great movie. <laughs> Tom, Tom Everett Scott. There we go. Tom Everett Scott. Tom Hanks's son once sat in my lap. 
Oh wow, which one? Oh my goodness, Colin Hanks. Okay, Colin Hanks. I was gonna say not not Chet, not 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 the no. not the problematic one. I mean, not the I didn't matter. know. I didn't know who he was, <laughs> and I told <laughs> and I told him to sit in my lap. I, the context is my band had a reunion show, and and a friend of mine here is friends with him, and he brought him to the show, and we were backstage after the show, and I was sitting on a chair, and I was kind of sweaty, and and my friend says. Hey guys, this is Colin. He's like, Colin, here they are, your new favorite band. He's like, you guys are great. And I'm like, come here and sit on my lap. (laughs) (laughs) I sat on my lap and I said, I appreciate you. And and he got up and then I later was like, that was Tom Hanks' son. That's funny. Did you ever see Life in Pieces? No. Yes. That that was the show he was in, right? Or one of the shows he was in. Yeah. Underrated show. I have watched that entire show a couple times through and through. Uh, Really, really good situational comedy yeah he was also in in the movie orange county which not the same as the the the, the much superior television show the oc but orange county which had jack black in it but fun fact california by phantom planet uh the theme song of the oc was actually on the orange county soundtrack and so they almost didn't choose you're bringing the fun facts indeed i know so they almost didn't choose it (laughs) as the theme song for the oc and it's like other than I don't want to wait by Paula Cole, probably like the most iconic like teen theme song ever, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 like those two songs because they were actual you know songs are like intertwined. Like you hear it, you hear the opening notes of the OC theme song, and you're like I fucking know it, right? And like they almost <laughs> that almost wasn't the theme song because it was in this movie that no one saw. And fortunately, they were like, no one saw the movie, didn't do anything we can go ahead and put, you know, uh, Sofia Coppola's cousin's band on, <laughs> on ma- ma- make it the theme song. We, we can go ahead and do that. I'm going to ask Aaron to write uh, a little ditty that we can play after this kind of thing where we can be like, and this has been Deep Cuts with Christina <laughs> Warren. Ba-da-ba-da-bump. I was going to say, I appreciate your level of fandom so much because I share it, but we're just in, when we have it in totally different places and uh and so i have when you're talking about these things i'm taking in the content but i'm also just appreciating the level of like <laughs> weird facts because i i i do this to my friends all the time and they're just like and then where the fuck did you learn that like i think i recently did we talk about how pat smear was late to a foo Fighters show in minneapolis and why have we talked about this no we haven't so we talk about it in, in 1996 i went to see the foo fighters it was the second time in that year that they played at, at uh first avenue and um and it was when they had their drummer before taylor Haw- taylor hawkins who was truly terrible as a fit uh i mean like really i went back and listened to a bootleg of that show in 1996 and it's just that band actually sounds terrible um and anyway so i go to see the foo fighters and and um, they're late going on. And it's like, get kind of used to that in those days. There was just a lot of junkie bands in that era, you know, when we were going to see Alice in Chains at First Avenue and dude like showed up about 20 minutes late. And in their first song, the drummer, the drummer jumped from his kit and and tackled Lane Staley, punched him. <laughs> and then the whole band was done. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but anyway, uh, so the Foo Fighters are late and I recently was reading, uh, uh, some piece about that tour that was written way back then. The reason they were late is because Pat Smear, who had been in the legendary punk rock band, the germs, mm-hmm. like the most uncontrollable possible kind of band with Darby crash, their singer, just a mess of a band. So you're assuming if you hear that Pat Smear is late, that it's junky stuff, right? <laughs> right. He lost track of time watching a Matlock marathon in the hotel. <laughs> that is amazing. That's that's the fucking best. The guy from the germs is like it's it's not junky. I mean, it might have been junky shit. No. I don't know, but that that actually sounds more like ADHD shit. Like that sounds like yeah. a reason that I would not go to college. Would be like yeah. I was watching like an ER marathon. Like, yeah. but, but also a Matlock marathon, I can totally see it. You get sucked in and you're yep. like, but Andy Griffith is going to solve the case. And yeah. it's gonna be I got to know what lawyers. happens. I got to know what happens. I got to see the lawyer scene, right? Fucking A. Amazing. That's so um, good. 
anyway, that's, that's amazing. That, that's an example of my level of fandom is I just love those little tidbits are just so remarkable. That was a fun, that was an amazing show in the sense that listening back to the um, bootleg of it, they, they basically played the first album mm-hmm. except for one song, which, which Dave Grohl introduced as something they had written a couple weeks ago. And it was my hero, right? which, uh, is, which, which was their, like which becomes their, their, like the song. Right. I was going to say, because it was My Hero and it was Big Me and uh-huh. and a couple others Everlong. from the second. Yeah, no, well, Everlong, but that was the third album, I think. But like, That's true, I mean, yeah. Oh, right, the you're sec- talking in that, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, it was the second album that they really like blew up, right? Because yeah. I remember, obviously, My Hero was big, but I also remember like, I remember the ever I remember the Big Me music video. Like they spoofed the Mentos ads. Do you yeah. guys remember that video? Yeah, the Mentos ads. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it, was, it was one of those things where like, and he had... Uh, it, it was just a great music video and it was one of those things where we were at least people my age we knew nirvana obviously um but we mostly were really aware of nirvana like post kurt's death but you know mtv would air the the unplugged like all on the time constant, on on repeat so for a lot of yeah. us like we we knew him and, and i think we weren't alone in this like certainly people my age but but i think even people older i think even like guys your age, like you maybe knew the, knew the band members more, but a lot of us, like we just knew Dave as like the drummer, right? We mm-hmm. just knew him as the drummer mm-hmm. of Nirvana. And so that's what you associate him with. And I think especially you see him all the time on MTV playing the drums in that unplugged setting, right? Where, yep. it, you know, which where he has to hold back. Neck. The turtleneck where he's having to hold back and like and and he's having to kind of like very kind of slowly play the drums in certain segments and whatnot and like you and, and you know that and then all of a sudden like he has this very different band and he's the singer he's not the drummer and you're like what the fuck yeah. right and it's um, good it, and it was really good right and then then especially the, and, those first two albums I I love I don't get with anything else I don't I'm not against it but I just don't get with anything no else. no, but those no two but albums I, th- are I think great. I think um I think actually I would say up through like what was it uh you know, uh, the first two albums were really good. And then I would say the third one too, right. The one with like, uh, learn to fly. Like I would say yeah. like, like, probably like, like the, the, the first three, um, are, are really solid. I saw them in, uh, last October with death cap for cutie. They opened a, oh, a nice. brand new, um, uh, a venue in, um, in Seattle, the, the climate change arena, which is the most bullshit name <laughs> for a, a thing. Is ever. that where climate- you go to change the climate? Well, and it's so stupid. They're like, oh, we care so much about carbon neutral this. And then I'm like, no, you fucking don't. Like, it's the most, it, this is the sort of woke shit that I can't stand because it's so performative and it's the so climate complete. change arena. The climate change I don't believe arena. it. No, and it's not. And they're like, I'm, I'm like, well, uh, but you're, you're, it's, it's, an, it's a rock arena. You're clearly not going to be doing a whole lot for climate change. You know what I mean? Like, there's going to oh be God, a whole lot of, of stuff that goes into this. It's such a fucking stupid name and such a performative stuff. Anyway. <laughs> That opened and Foo Fighters were the first um, uh, band to play and then Death Cab um, opened for them and I was able to get tickets and I'm so glad I got to go. I was sick. I was not feeling good. We had to actually leave early, which kills me now, but I saw most of the the, the really big hits, which look, let's let's face it, like that's why you go to a Foo Fighters show, right? Like, you know, at this point, mm-hmm. like you're not going to see like all the new shit. Like, and they knew that. They were amazing live. And, and I like Taylor was great. And I remember I was commenting to Grant. I was like, they have this sort of star power, especially for rock stars that you almost never see today of people who just have like a complete command of the audience and, and a large audience, right. You know, this is a decent sized arena, not a stadium, but a decent sized arena. And they, you know, had like the whole command of everything. They knew what they were doing. It was really, really good. And it's just, you know, now I'm really glad I got to see that show even as sick as I was because, um, that's the last time we'll, you know, I, I ever got to see yeah. the band actually, you know, intact together. But, but that is funny that, that, that Taylor Hawkins used that he was not like it, that it didn't work. That's really, really funny. Oh yeah. The guy. Okay. We're, just, we're at the, me, we're at the end of the window. Go ahead. Jeff. <laughs> I'll say this, which is just yeah, the guy, the guy that was the first drummer just was, it was an awful fit. And, and it's, uh, it's, sorry for him that he lost that gig, but it, when I listened back to the tape of that show, I was like, this doesn't even sound like a good band. Right. That's how much the drummer sort of impacted. He was not it. And, and then yeah. they, and then, and they get Alanis Morissette's like session drummer and they're like, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So here's a question. Is there anything that matters more than the safety of you and your loved ones? Of course not. 
So isn't it strange that many home security companies don't act that way? This is why we use and trust Simply Safe Home Security. Their advanced security technology helps us sleep at night, and they always put our family's safety first. Here's why I love it. With 24-7 professional monitoring, Simply Safe's agents call you the moment a threat is detected and dispatch police or first responders in an emergency, even if you're not home or can't be reached. Simply Safe's monitoring agents truly care about your well-being and are highly trained to help keep you calm and safe during stressful situations, staying on the line with you until help arrives. Simply Safe's customer first policies make sure you're taken care of with affordable plans starting at less than a dollar a day and no long-term contract or hidden fees because feeling safe at home shouldn't break the bank. Customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash overtired. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. That Go to simplysafe.com slash overtired. That's S-I-M-P-L-I-S-A-F-E dot com slash overtired. Crap, I'm still chewing my granola bar. Oh, man. That was, that was your segue to handle right there. Um, so before, before we go on, I think we, we're doing, we're doing promo swaps with some other podcasts that are, uh, related to what we talk about. And there's one called, uh, weirds of a feather Yep. that really, uh, very, it focuses on ADHD and, and I feel like it's a good mix, a uh, good match for us, uh, Christina, do you want to tell us about Weirds of a Feather? Uh, definitely. So if you are all caught up with Overtired and you're looking for more random yet informative discussions, flock over to Weirds of a Feather, which is an ADHD-adjacent podcast. Co-hosts and childhood friends Grace Bore and Kristen Stanhope will take you on a journey through the beautiful, chaotic experience of life with ADHD. Some describe Weirds of a Feather as the puppy bowl for any serious ADHD podcast Super Bowl. I love that. While others feel like they are hanging out with their two neurodivergent aunts. Weekly episodes are jam-packed with an ever-rotating schedule of segments such as the ADHD Learning Corner, Hobby Collectors, Little Accomplishments, and a leading favorite, quote, I'm so quirky. If you are looking for a unique podcast that encourages you to embrace your weirdness, this is the one. Check out Weirds of a Feather today wherever you listen to podcasts. So let's do a little tech talk. I uh, So my Synology started resetting and it has a faulty reset button. Yep. Um, and instead of trying to deal with repair, I just ordered just a, new, a new Synology. I got the uh, DS1520 Plus. Um, and I put, I put two, two, 400 gigabyte SSD, uh, cash cards into it, ported all of my hard drives over, added an extra hot swap drive because I went from four bays to five bays and holy shit. Everything is so much faster than my four, eight, 19, four, four. I don't even remember what I had before. Uh, it was it was slow compared to this. I'm I'm very impressed with the speed of my new DS fifteen twenty plus. I'm having a blast with it. That's fantastic. I'm really I'm really glad to hear that like you're having a good experience with it. Um, and and that this is one you got the one like with still with an Intel, so you can still do the the Plex stuff, right? Right. It can still it can still video encode. Yes. Yeah, because you were saying that's the thing with the new ones is that they're AMD, and I guess for whatever reason they don't have um like an onboard you know video thing. So I guess they probably can still encode, but they'd have to do it with CPU wise, so it'd be yeah. uh slower. So um that's awesome. I'm glad that that uh that you're enjoying it. I need to, I've needed to get a new Synology. I've been looking into my options. And so this is um, helpful for me. I was curious because you're using the, the NVMe cache, um, which I haven't used on, on any of mine over the years. Have, have you found that that sped up your operations just in terms of like accessing smaller things? So I put the NVMe drives into it from the get go. So I have no I have no grounds for comparing what this particular model would be like without the cache drive. Right. So I don't I don't know exactly what benefit it is providing me. 
Um, they offer, if you turn on, you can analyze your cash and it takes like a month and it, it basically at the end of a month of running this analysis, it will tell you like exactly what size cash you should specify and, and how well your cash is performing. And I've only had this for a few days, so I haven't, I haven't run that yet, but, uh, in general, I have to assume, given the speed at which the DSM, not the DSM-6, the the uh, interface that uh, Synology provides for their, uh, right. f- for all the software on this machine, um, uh, the speed at which it loads is 10 times faster than what I had without any cash. Drive. Right, which I have to imagine, like, obviously it's a, it's a faster machine, but I have to imagine the big part of that is the cash. And and that definitely is awesome. I have to say, like, that's the big thing that I've, I've looked at QNAP. I've looked at some other solutions, would look at, like, building my own. Um, but the thing I think that's going to keep me with Synology is I love DSM. Like, that's just, it's really good software, right? Like, like their interface for managing everything is, yeah. is in my opinion, just kind of, like, top-notch you know, like it's just if if you're gonna pick one of those systems, it's really the best. Again, I have nothing to compare to because I've never used anything similar before. Uh, I will say that, yeah, I'm constantly impressed with it, and uh, n- no, no complaints. I know that Jeff has an even better Synology than I do. Um, have you, Jeff? Like did brag. you have any Synology? Pr- did you have one prior to that? No, this is my first Synology, and it's also with the cash and lots of cash, and <laughs> it's a lovely machine. But I've barely used it for I barely used it for anything beyond just storage. Uh, Brett, you know that because I've sent you pictures. Prior to getting the Synology, I I had a collection of probably twenty external hard drives just over the years that had kind mm-hmm. of filled up with stuff, and I'd be like, I'll start that later, and so the furthest I've even gotten with that Synology is getting all that stuff onto the Synology. I will say that I, I had my concerns with, you know, multiple terabytes of data uh, going from one Synology to another, as long as you put the drives in, in order, uh, even after all mm-hmm. of the resetting and, and failures that I had had, all of my data was safe. I didn't lose anything. Um, I use my Synology to run private, git server um so all of my like coding projects that i'm not open sourcing and putting on github uh are all on git repos on the synology and i didn't lose any of them i reinstalled the git server and everything just hooked back up uh grateful that it was so easy but yeah should we should we do some some gratitude sheila I can't wait till we have theme music. I just gotta, I just gotta get with Aaron about exactly what we want for our segue here. Just imagine, imagine if in you a will, world. an amazing, an amazing, <laughs> very short, like five second segue that lets you know this is. Let you know what time it is. Lets you know to shut off the faucet if you're doing the dishes and pay attention. All right, Jeff, go ahead. This is a sort of. It's it's not exactly gratitude, but it is. Uh, so my sixteen year old is um, loves to do like game dev stuff in Unity, um, and has been learning it for the last year and a half or so. Maybe even since it's kind of midway through the the shutdown year of the pandemic, and um, and they have a challenge. There's a challenge called Ludum Dare which is this like, you know, Friday through Monday challenge to develop a game on a theme. So they announce the theme and you just go to work and people do it individually. They do it um, in pairs. My son did it in pairs with a friend of his who lives in Chicago. And it was so cool to watch. Like he was just, I mean, not that this is good practice or good thing to teach kids, uh, but he was at his computer Um doing coding and doing some blender like 3d rendering stuff from Friday through Monday uh, morning when he went to school and um, and he was on the on a discord chat with his friend and they, they so here's here's what was so amazing about it so my gratitude is that is the, is for the whole unity 
community in this case, at least in the, the way that he's experienced it. Um, they had a theme, which was every 10 seconds. That was the theme. And so he and his friend developed a game where essentially there's a level and you are alive for 10 seconds and you die and come back with a new power. And you have just enough time to figure out what that power is to try to get you through the level before the 10 <laughs> seconds runs up and you die That's and you awesome. come back with another new power. Um, and, and it was just really cool. I've never, this is the first time I've seen him in a real like de- dev state basically. And it was just super cool to see. Like I, I, I loved watching it. I loved how much fun he had and they have the best. This is what I love is that once you're done, all of the people who um, made games, if, it, depending on so if you're a developer you made a game if you play five games your game won't end up getting recommended that much in the algorithm but if you play 20 games that other people developed or 100 games that other people developed your game shows up more in the algorithm when people are searching for games from the challenge huh. to play and so by participating with other people's work your work gets more out there um which i thought was just such a cool just a cool rule so anyway yeah. just I love that. Um, lo- loving that he's found a sort of home to learn coding and 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 modeling and all that stuff in, and just gra- graptitude. I got nothing but graptitude for it. It's fun to watch. I was jealous too. I want to make a game. Graptitude. Yeah, totally. <laughs> anyway, all right. Who else? I-, I can actually go. Or if you are you ready, Brett? Okay, so I don't think we ever talked about this one. If we did, then correct me. But the, you talking about Unity and your son making games actually made me think of uh, this because I don't think we talked about this. It's called uh, the Apple Store Time Machine. And it was yeah. uh, a Unity thing that was created by uh, Michael Siebler, who um, basically taught himself, Steeper, sorry, Michael Sieber, who basically taught himself Unity. And are, are, have either of you seen this? No, I'm looking it up right now. Okay, yep. so this came out, uh, I think, at the end of July. <laughs> it got a lot of links on the blogs. Ah. We didn't talk about it, but it's actually awesome. It is uh, a it works on on um, Apple Silicon and on Intel, and it is basically like a a history, like a walkthrough of the Apple Store at certain iconic times in history. So, like, and it's like, and and what he's done is he's basically gone through and gotten the layouts of certain stores at certain years. And recreated in Unity in 3D exactly what those stores looked back look like on their opening day. So you have the the Tyson store uh, Tyson's Corner store, which was the very first Apple store uh, from 2001. There's like one in, in a, a, a mini store inside a Stanford shopping mall. There's the Fifth Avenue store from 2006, and then the Infinite yeah. Loop Company store from 2015. And the level of detail that is in this is. Un- this is amazing real. there's emacs 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 not only that but like like every level of detail like the software packages like if you go in through the fifth avenue store in 2006 like you see like every like piece of software that was you know that he basically went through photographs and he recreated them all in unity and um you can even do things like Damn. turn on some of the emacs like they're a little um uh, like uh like <laughs> easter eggs uh, within these things and it is completely like era appropriate it is so it's such a trip to basically walk through memory lane like seeing the old software boxes was like a real trip for me yeah the um, software and, boxes and and, and and it's like you can zoom in enough and you can actually see like this is like what like the the apps were and what was on display and like in 2001 i'd forgotten how much um because of, you know at the time apple didn't have a bunch of stuff to sell so like they didn't even have the ipod yet so like a lot of what they had like yes. on display is they had like the nomad and they had other non uh you know apple music things but they had a ton of consumer electronics like there was a, a oh my god toast of, like, yeah <laughs> but, but there, 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 there's like a shitload of like canon mini dv cameras and stuff you know on display because Again, they didn't have much to sell, right? So, right. you know, it, it, it was power books and iBooks and and Emacs and iMacs and like that was that was kind of it. And uh, anyway, it's an incredible uh, labor of of love and attention to detail. Um, it's free. You can download to, to uh, you can donate to him on on Gumroad. Um, he's also like open for work, but this is just one of like the most incredible um, like apps that I've seen. Um, that somebody kind of create and it, you talked about unity reminded me of that because <laughs> that was sort of his impetus. Like he wanted to learn unity and he did. And it's amazing. Yeah. I, I am amazed. I mean, I'm surprised. I loved the idea as you described it, but as I, I pulled up the website and it's got the sort of walkthroughs already, 
I was amazed at how much I like my hormones were releasing. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Brett, Brett Stripstra. Nice. <laughs> All right. I was, I was going to talk about NA, which is my own project I've been consumed with lately, but I, I'm actually going to mention poster, you know, um, so it's a it's a photo collaging app. Uh, let me drop a link in here for you guys. Um, there are very few times that I actually need to collage photos, but uh, say a pet's birthday or the death of a pet, I often want to make a sure. photo collage of of the best photos available. Um, these are. They, in 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 memory, these are the times right. that I want a photo collage app, and there are not a lot of good option options for Mac uh, for easily making cool looking right. photo collages. And Posterino fits the bill. I'm currently on the beta for the upcoming version, uh, which is why it's top of mind for me. Uh, the new version, uh, at Apple Silicon support, full uh, Ventura support, all of this, uh, plus a few new features and. Uh, it is, it's super, like you can make a great looking photo collage in under five minutes, uh, just dragging a bunch of photos onto a layout and it'll, it'll collage them all automatically. And then you can go in, you can individually crop and, and rotate and position, uh, different elements. You can do like grids, you can do scatters, you can do circular, oh, cool. uh, you can change the frame on each individual image. And like, if you, one of my favorite things is if you create a layout uh, of any, you know, scatter or grid or whatever, select all and then drag one image onto the selection, it will scatter that image so that all of the little photos together make up the big photo. Awesome. Um, I can't remember what he calls that, but it, you can make some really cool looking images out of that. And it, you know, you don't always need a photo collage app, but when you do, Post Reno is one of the best available. Yeah, for no, Mac. that's awesome. Um, and and can you can you print these too, or or is it primarily okay? Because yeah. I was thinking, I was like, this would be awesome for things for my nephew, and um, you know, I, I like created a photo book for his first birthday and christening, but this would be great, like as an additional thing. I, I think you have, I think you have to buy the pro version to print straight from Post Reno. Um, and I don't know what, I think the beta indicates there's going to be a new, like a subscription model for pro access, which, like I said, I use it, you know, twice a year, depending on how many right. pets die. Um, so I, I don't know if I would go for a pro subscription or not. Uh, but I'm not sure what the pricing model is going to be yet. Um, uh, you can, however, output to any DPI uh, PNG, right? Which, 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 which would be, to. which would be fine. Cause so, I was just thinking, I was like, Oh, you could combine this with like some of the photo services and whatnot. Cause like, I don't have the ability to print what I would want to do anyway. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> print directly from it. Like if I can output yeah. it to like, you know, uh, PNG or JPEG or, or even PDF, then like I'm fine. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. That's my pick. Well, good talk. All right. Well, 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 and then that's when you, you pat your legs in the Midwest. <laughs> you pat your legs. You say, well, and then it's time to go. Um, okay, thanks, you guys. Get some sleep. <laughs> Get some sleep. The system is going down low. Hey there, good people. Before you go, we have a bunch of new places where you can interact with us. Please check out our Instagram feed, our YouTube channel, Twitter, of course, and sign up for the Overtired newsletter, which will sort of pick up where the show leaves off with expanded show notes, uh, a little bit of what the three of us get up to between episodes. And let's face it, there'll be some musings. How can you resist musings? You'll find details for all the ways to interact with us in the show notes and at overtired.com. And thank you, thank you, thank you, as always, for listening.